Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, Anne. And uh, I, I, like many of you, had had hoped that we were able to, to to gather in person. I was really looking forward to that, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to resume our our in person event soon. I think there's a lot of the the side conversations. I think for many of you participating, really a sense of community. You know, as an MPN patient, you're you're not alone. Uh, clearly, there are many that care deeply about you, both uh, other patients in a community, as well as a community of, of foundations, such as a wonderful MPN Research Foundation, uh, MPN Advocacy. Uh, clearly, many in the pharmaceutical industry that really are trying to make a difference in helping, and clearly many of us in the, the medical community. So it, it's really a, a great community. Now, Anna had asked me to speak today to you know, one in light of, of today's topic, MPNs, but with a special eye on, on issues as they relate to, to issues of gender. And they are important. There are many aspects that, that we have learned about. Uh, and, and Laura did a fabulous job in the initial talk, really drilling into some of those specifically. I'm going to give a bit more broad overview as it relates to MPNs, but where, where appropriate, will mention issues of gender and how they have an uh, impact. Are you able to see my slides okay, Anne? Yep, I see everything. Great, great. So here are my disclosures. So first, as we think about having an, an MPN, you know, what is the burden of having these diseases? And again, I'm mindful of framing it in that way because the journey with an MPN is incredibly heterogeneous. There's everything from teenagers to 90 year olds. There's individuals where their MPN really affects them on a daily basis. And others who truly tell me, if you didn't tell me I had the disease, I wouldn't know. So it's really quite variable. Now, first, what do we know about the MPN stats in the United States? Well, our data is not perfect by any means. It's, it's a harder thing to put your arms around than we might imagine. But roughly, we estimate that there's probably between 300 and 500,000 patients in the US with MPNs. So this in the grand scheme of things means that it's not common, but neither should it be viewed that it is ultra rare. You know, we truly have some diseases that are incredibly rare that have handfuls of patients that occur across the United States. This is clearly not the case for MPNs. The majority of MPN patients are those with ET and PV. Myelofibrosis is the smallest of the three of the three groups. Roughly last time we looked, about 150 to 200,000 with PV and ET each respectively, maybe 20 to 30,000 with myelofibrosis. But those numbers probably are, are not perfect. They may underestimate things as well. Second, how old are people with MPNs? Well, it's pretty variable. You know, you'll look online and you'll find averages that have been published from the past, anywhere from 60 to 65, probably for all three of them. However, that can be a little misleading. It makes it seem that everybody is older that has the disease. An average is exactly that, just an average. I think if we think about the distribution, how does that relate to each decade of life? It's flatter than we imagine. With ET and PB in particular, there are many individuals in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. There clearly are some in their 20s. There can be some in their teenage years, although that's, that's not common. And then clearly individuals who are older than that as well. So even if the average is roughly 60-ish, it doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of younger people that have the disease. Overall, people with myelofibrosis do tend to be older than those with ET or PV, but that is not universal. When we think about diseases, we think about the incidence, how many are new cases per year, but the numbers that I quote you are really about the prevalence. So given that many individuals can live many years with MPNs, sometimes their normal lifespan, you know, I focus a bit more on prevalence, how many folks are out there. 
Now the burden is quite heterogeneous. So because of that, I like to think about it in, in different categories and really check off each of these boxes when I visit with a new patient. You know, have there been blood clots or bleeding or are there, is there a risk for these to occur? Is the spleen enlarged? Uh, that is more common in myelofibrosis, but can occur in ET and PV. Uh, are there symptoms? And we'll talk more about the symptoms. The symptoms can be a big detriment to quality of life. They can be associated with the biology of the disease. Is the disease progressing or likely to progress? Indeed, for many, it is progression that is what makes an MPM life-threatening. For many, it is not necessarily life-threatening at the time of diagnosis, but if it progresses, it can become so. Then finally, are there low blood counts? For some, this is an issue. Sometimes this is from medications. And all of this occurs in the context of a person. You know, an MPN is just one disease state, but we're all different, you know, and you can have the same disease state in two different individuals with different baseline levels of health, fitness, age, medicines, comorbidities, and the impact for them might be dramatically different. Now, one of the areas that our group has been really interested in, and that's been work from Dr. Sherber, Dr. Geyer, Dr. Duick, and, and many colleagues uh, along the way, is regarding symptoms, quality of life, and how to factor this in in the context of everything else within MPNs. It's not only about symptoms and quality of life, but it's an incredibly important piece. Now, when we speak of these, it's important to recognize that quality of life and symptoms are complementary concepts. Quality of life is a really broad concept. You know, the gap between one's life expectations and actual life experiences. So for example, right now we are all having a, a decrease in our quality of life for many reasons because of COVID-19. Uh, we're not able to gather together. That is, that is a negative. It's had financial implications. It's been a stressor for us uh, on, on many levels. Maybe we've, loved, we've lost loved ones. So it's been a big decrease to our quality of life, even if it hasn't necessarily directly impacted our own health. Health-related quality of life is a subset of this. Things related to your own individual health and how it impacts your quality of life. And that's important. Now, health-related quality of life can include symptoms. You know, if I have severe itching and I can't go to sleep, that, that, is, that is clearly impacting my quality of life. But there are other things related to your health-related quality of life. It can include financial toxicity, the expense of medications that is a burden for you. It can include the hassle of medical care. Well, I have to get a blood transfusion every two weeks. And because of that, I can't really travel to any great degree because I have to worry about where I'm going to get blood if I was to go on a longer trip. Now, symptoms are an important part of this. And they are, by their own nature, subjective. Only you can share with us what are your symptoms. So how do we try to quantify that? Well, there is a lot of science behind this and it's simple questions, but in questions that hopefully people can understand. And if we ask two different people the same question, do they really uh, interpret it in the same way? We've developed a series of questionnaires that as Laura had raised in her talk, have become the, the standard of how we ask these questions. This has now been done in a variety of languages and we have data really in thousands of patients from around the world. What we've learned is that the experience is pretty consistent. You know, the symptoms that you have are not dramatically different than people in Uruguay or Madagascar or Australia or in China. And that those experiences, you know, just help to further validate that these are things being caused by the disease. There can be cultural impact in terms of how people rate the severity of symptoms, but typically not their presence or even their rank order in terms of what bothers them. 
As we look at these symptoms, you'll see the prevalence, how likely are they to be present, you see are fairly present on the left. How severe they are on a one to 10 scale is very individualized. You'll see that myeloid fibrosis patients are the most symptomatic, but what surprises some individuals is how symptomatic certain patients with ET or PV can be. Not everyone is. And many times, some of these symptoms are present from the time of diagnosis. So I will have patients who don't have any symptoms who come to see me and say, boy, do I have to really worry that they're going to change and occur a month from now? Not necessarily. Now, in our efforts to try to better understand the burden of what people are facing, there was a collaborative study that I helped to lead that was a landmark study in MPNs. And here we saw that in the majority, with myelofibrosis being the most prevalent, that MPN symptoms did reduce quality of life. We saw in terms of most common symptoms, fatigue is the most common symptom across all MPNs. And as we look at second and third most common symptoms, there it gets a little bit more uh, different. For myelofibrosis, it was abdominal discomfort or night sweats, insomnia. For PV, it was itching and insomnia. And for ET, it was bruising and numbness in the, or tingling in the hands or feet. Again, if you look at this, similarities, but some differences. I've seen as well that there's certain symptoms that can be associated with worsening disease, meaning weight loss and fevers in particular, ones that we associate much more with myelofibrosis than we might with PV or ET. And sometimes can be a sign of progression from, from ET or PV into myelofibrosis. The symptom people would want to resolve the most, fatigue. Again, it's the most common, but there are exceptions. There are people in which if itching is particularly bad, that is one of the most difficult to live with that drives people's decisions. Now, clearly people are interested in a range of ways to try to improve them. And many are trying to impact symptoms with exercise, sometimes with non-prescription supplements. We probably have more benefit and more data that exercise may be helpful than non-prescription supplements. I will share as we think about complementary therapies, the way to think of these is not instead of the medical therapies your doctors recommend, but things to use in addition. There is an impact of having an MPN, and hopefully this continues to decrease as we work further toward developing new therapies, but can impact things such as the ability to work. Sometimes people have retired early, sometimes are medically disabled, sometimes just reduce the hours at work. And one thing we found that was interesting is, you know, as we talk about therapies or trials that are trying to expand what therapies we have, what are the goals of therapy? So it's interesting that for patients, the biggest concern is I don't want the disease to get worse. It doesn't mean that they don't care about other goals, such as preventing blood clots or improving quality of life. For physicians, interestingly, for ET and PV, it has historically been around preventing vascular events. And in myelofibrosis, it's been around symptom improvement. And part of that has been kind of the evolution of the therapies that we have. Physicians do tend to frame the goals of therapy regarding what are the benefits of the therapy that they have to offer. So let's talk a little bit about trials. But with each of the three diseases, we'll first start with, well, really, what is the standard? Because as we talk about clinical trials, a clinical trial is basically where we are trying to change how we normally treat the disease with either a new therapy, a new combination, a new dose, or something that is new. And at a high level, what a trial is designed to do is to try to answer the question, well, is it better than what we do now? It is 
by its nature, a very incremental process. How do you incrementally continue to get better? Now, with any trial or therapy, our goals of what we hope that therapy to achieve is an incredibly important part of the decision-making. So for example, there are medicines that we will use that may help to improve anemia. That's our only expectation of them. Let's say erythropoietin stimulating agents for anemia and myelofibrosis. It's a therapy that we do not really have a scientific expectation that it's gonna improve spleen or that it's necessarily going to you know, impact you know, molecular mutations. Now, as we think about trials, we first start, well, what is the current standard? Now, the standard has come up with pretty much by committee in the US, and this is a very madman sort of photo uh, I put in facetiously regarding the committee that is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. It's a group that people rotate. I was the first chair of this group. It includes people from about 30 cancer centers across the country. And they look at trials, they look at evidence to try to at least set up what is the standard across the United States for people to receive therapy. So these guidelines are important because they do help frame not only what physicians are doing, sometimes how they're judged, but also what's reimbursed by either Medicare or insurance companies. Now guidelines is important don't tell your doctor exactly what to do. What they do is they share, well, what are the options in that situation? So I like to say that guidelines provide the, the guardrails. You know, what is the science of medicine? You know, so for example, in PV, our frontline therapies include hydroxyurea and pegylated interferon. If I wanted to use, let's say, Herceptin, a drug that we use for breast cancer in polycythemia vera, there's no evidence to do that. I would be medically at fault for giving a therapy that had no evidence that's not in the guidelines. Uh, and there'd be no reason for me to do so. If I was to offer that, I would both need a rationale and a trial and have to convince our institutional review board and sometimes the National Cancer Institute that the rationale for using that therapy was strong enough to really make it worthwhile in terms of being safe and expectations of it being effective for our patients. The art of medicine, which is significant, is all things considered, including your voice, you know, your own wishes and desires as to which therapy is selected. So let's start with essential thrombocytopenia. So what is our current standard. So these are, are not the friendliest in terms of readability, but I'll, I'll walk you through. These are exactly what your doctors see. The ascents start with risk. And here, these tend to be uh, younger patients. They've not had a vascular event. And very low risk may be those that are calreticulin mutated. We're controlling cardiovascular risk factors, aspirin. So primarily aspirin maybe no aspirin if, if calreticulin mutated. Then they're monitoring to see how people are doing. And if they're not doing well, they're having difficult symptoms or having other issues, then we consider starting on medicines to lower the blood counts. So this first algorithm is primarily around watching folks and giving aspirin. Individuals that are intermediate in risk and Laura raise a very important point as it related to controlling cardiovascular risk factors. This group, again, likely will begin on medicines to lower the counts, control the platelet counts. High risk folks are folks from the earlier lower or intermediate risk that had symptoms or had difficulty. We start on medicines to directly lower the platelets to ideally under 400,000 or below. This complements aspirin, which helps to make the platelets less sticky and decrease the risk of blood clots or bleeding. Here, hydrea is the recommended therapy with interferon, pegylated interferon, 
or other options such as an agrolide as a backup. Then they're really tasked with seeing, okay, well, are you having a good enough response? And if not, if you started with one, do you then go back to one of the other therapies? So primarily, hydrea, interferon, and agrolide is the main things that are used and in the guidelines. Now, there are several things that are in development in trials. So trials, again, are trying to expand that. What else should we consider if approved? Well, first, as we'll talk about in PV, there's a different formulation of interferon, ropegulated interferon, that may well be effective. And it's going to be tested in this group. And there's an ongoing study for people that have failed hydria, led by Dr. Rostopchik and I, versus anagrolide, uh, trying to get an approval in ET. Second, there are trials. This is a single arm study for people that have failed hydria with the LSD1 inhibitor from Imago IMG7289. We'll get around to the trials in P-Vera in just a moment. Ruxolidinib as a JAK inhibitor can have benefit in these patients. It is considered a backup option for people with difficult symptoms and spleen and has certainly shown benefit in trials from the United Kingdom. And I certainly have used it in difficult circumstances. It still does not have an approval, but certainly can be used, but not typically as an initial offering. The drug I had mentioned from Imago is an LSD1 inhibitor. It's working in the bone marrow against the megakaryocytes. And there's both trials from the company as well as an investigator initiated study at our center that again, we hope will have an impact both helping to control the platelets, but hopefully a deeper impact in terms of the disease, maybe decrease the likelihood of disease progression. The ET outlook, I think there's gonna be an increasing role of interferons and possibly a ROPEG approval in the future. Uh, IMG7289 is working in a different way and it's currently in trials. I do think JAK inhibition remains a viable backup option. Longer term, calreticulin mutated uh, patients may have some other options as well. It has long been speculated that certain immune therapies might be helpful for calreticulin mutated disease with vaccines or other approaches. These are not yet in trials, but may be available soon. But again, probably would be for individuals who had calreticulin mutated disease, but we're not doing well with current options. Again, most of these trials are in the situation where the current therapy option for you is not, uh, is not working or you tried it and it didn't agree with you. Now let's pivot to PV. In PV, the biggest difference between PV and ET in terms of therapy is also the important control of the hematocrit which we have learned over time needs to be under 45%, the percent of blood by volume that are red blood cells. So low risk, again, like ET, we're doing aspirin, but here we're also trying to control the hematocrit. Phlebotomy is used. Now, phlebotomy can have negatives. Uh, it can cause fatigue. It can make you iron deficient. It might make the symptoms of the MPN more challenging. Some people do great with phlebotomy. Some people feel terrible with phlebotomies. And that's all part of this algorithm. If you're doing well, you don't have a lot of symptoms, you're on phlebotomy, the disease isn't bothering you, you're younger, you've not had blood clots, great, that might be sufficient. Many, however, fall in the category of needing medical therapy. They have symptoms, they're not feeling well, They uh, don't tolerate phlebotomies well, they need a lot of phlebotomies, any of these sort of circumstances, then we start to consider therapy to, again, control the blood counts. Ideally, keeping the hematocrit under 45 with zero or few phlebotomies, the platelets under 400,000, the white cell count under 10,000. Here, those guidelines include hydria or pegylated interferon as frontline option with either one being able to be chosen. And I have a discussion with patients regarding the plus and minus of, of each. 
Now, if you start on that and you're doing well, great. But if you don't, then we consider switching to something else. Ruxolitinib is approved in this setting or Jacofine, and it's particularly helpful if you have symptoms, if you have enlarged spleen, if you have evidence of progression. If you have failed hydria and not had pegylated interferon, you might circle back to that. But again, ruxolitinib is approved in that setting and pegylated interferon is, is not yet approved. So there may be a variety of, uh, of advantages to, to starting there and then going to pegylated interferon. There are other options that we will use uh, less commonly, but there are other backup options, but they do potentially come with some other negatives. Now, ropegylated interferon or bezremi is, is another pegylated interferon. It's given every two weeks. It's approved in Europe and it is seeking an approval in the US first in PV and then in ET. Long-term data from Europe has been beneficial. They've been tracking this agent now for many years, both an initial study compared to hydria as well as a continuation study. With this, they see that interestingly, when we compare hydria and interferon, both ropeg as well as pegasus, through the first year, the drugs are relatively equivalent in terms of control of the disease. Where the interferons, I think, start to shine is really over a longer period of time. More time on the drug, better control of disease, better ability to tolerate the drug over time. Um, probably at least equivalent control in terms of decreasing the risk of blood clots and bleeding. You know, the number of events are so few, it's a little difficult to separate those two. Probably lower risk being on interferon in terms of secondary malignancies, particularly skin cancers. And higher rates of improvement in the molecular response. Now, we still don't know whether this is the, the perfect metric for assessing long-term response in PV, but it certainly seems favorable. A new class of drugs is being looked at to try to better control the hematocrit. One that's getting a lot of attention is an interesting drug called PTG300, and there's other drugs kind of in this class that are being investigated that look to mimic uh, iron deficiency, but without people being iron deficient where it can create a state that looks to the body like anemia of chronic disease by stimulating or being a substitute for a molecule that we call hepcidin. This trial that was led by my good friends at Mount Sinai showed the ability to help to control the hematocrit and make people phlebotomy independent with the use of this therapy. And in theory, might have benefits both with and without other cytoreductive therapy. Now, why would it be that valuable to be phlebotomy independent? Well, when you have phlebotomies, you can imagine that your hematocrit is always going up, and then you get a phlebotomy, it goes down and up and down, and it's and it really is very up and down. And with that, there are some negatives in terms of symptoms. There can be iron deficiency. But also there may be a more exposure to higher hematocrits that might increase your risk of blood clots and bleeding. So it may have advantages in terms of, of safety. It was able to be demonstrated that in addition to control of the hematocrit, it did help to improve symptoms. So what's the PV outlook? I think increasing role of interferons and possible ROPEG approval maybe soon. PTG300 and other agents likely will play a role and they may be alone or in combination. They may also play a role in lower risk individuals that we previously had only treated with phlebotomy and aspirin. Part of the reason we only treated lower risk patients with phlebotomy and aspirin was in part because uh, 
of concerns regarding the safety of hydrea. So the concerns regarding hydrea, you know, have historically made the therapy of Pivera very conservative. I do think ruxolitinib is underutilized. I think this is a good drug in PV, and there's a lot of people who remain on hydrea that are not doing well that probably would be better served on ruxolitinib. And there are other agents in development. Now let's pivot finally toward myelofibrosis. Myelofibrosis can be the most burdensome of MPNs, and it is the one that can be clearly the most life-threatening. We start by stratifying individuals by risk, and there's complicated algorithms that your doctors use, looking at your clinical features, molecular features, blood counts, and others to assess how likely is the disease going to be life-threatening for you. Is it going to be life-threatening for you this year, next year, in five years, 10 years, or, or longer? And that's a very important initial step. Low-risk asymptomatic patients, we still will likely observe. Low-risk symptomatic patients, we will consider ruxolitinib, which has now been the standard for almost a decade, with some alternatives depending upon high blood counts that can be considered. Higher-risk patients, which is the vast majority, we do stratify by low by the platelet count. People with a very low platelet count and high risk, or your high risk either way, we will consider whether or not a bone marrow transplant should be considered. It's a very complicated therapy. It comes with a risk. It can be life-saving. It's probably one of the most complex decisions we have in medicine and really would be a subject of its own discussion. As it relates to medical treatment, which almost always occur, even if we move to transplant, we probably will start people on medical therapy first. People with, with low platelets, we really have no option. And I'll just show this as a holding place for you because we are hopeful for an approval soon of a medication called procretinib, which has shown safety and effectiveness in this group of people. So it would really help to give us an option for this group of people who don't really have a great option a group that we call cytopenic myelofibrosis that can be low platelets and or anemic. Above 50,000, ruxolitinib and fedratinib are our frontline therapies. Uh, and the experience with ruxolitinib is longer. Uh, fedratinib, we will consider in this group, and there's some data about giving full dose maybe for patients that have lower platelets. We're monitoring for response. And then if no response, here's where we circle back and consider giving fedratinib a second line for those that had ruxolitinib in the front line or clinical trials. So in myelofibrosis, there are several different clinical trial groups occurring currently. First, some medicines that can improve anemia, like lispatercept, some medicines that might make an impact on initial therapy like ruxolitinib with the bed inhibitor pelabresib or ruxolitinib with nevitoclax. But most are actually being tested in this group. They started one of these therapies, they didn't respond. What else should we do? Now those with anemia who only have anemia, we may consider other complementary medicines to try to help to improve anemia. Now, as our algorithms evolve with options, this may change. So, for example, a spatter set might be an option that might jump in there. Uh, it's approved in NDS and hemoglobinopathies. It's recommended as a backup therapy, but might become more central. Likewise, if we have therapies that impact anemia up front, palabresib, mamalodinib, others, that may change the treatment algorithms. Anytime any new drug is approved, all of these algorithms are re-looked at to see which of them should be adjusted based on a new drug being available. Now I've mentioned two JAK inhibitors which are approved that your doctors can prescribe and some of you are on, on one or have been on both of these, ruxolitinib and fedratinib. There's two that we believe that are on the cusp of approval. First, likely pacritinib, and then mamalotinib, pacritinib that can impact spleen symptoms 
and is safe and effective for people, even irrespective of lower plate accounts, with particular activity for people that have uh, uh, low platelets and or anemia, and mamalodinib, which also can help to specifically improve anemia uh, in a beneficial way, as well as spleen and symptoms. Mamalodinib has been tested in large phase three studies, including Simplify 1 and Simplify 2. And we've shown recently that individuals who achieved an improvement in transfusion dependence, became transfusion independent, likely live longer as a consequence of the benefit. So very interesting to see that by improving anemia, that alone might help individuals live longer. Pacridinib, several important trials, some of which I was involved with leading, such as PERSIST-1. Again, showing really good effectiveness, but the key was that a broader group of patients was able to be treated. Normally, patients with low plate accounts have not been eligible to be treated on other clinical trials, but it really is a big incremental difference. There are a variety of important combinations which are ongoing now in phase three trials. Lospatercept helping to improve anemia, uh, CPI 0610, which is called Pelabrecid, which has shown effectiveness that may be disease modifying in individuals in upfront therapy in combination with RUX or in second line therapy as an add on. Same is true for Navidoclax. The spider receptor has helped to improve that anemia, both in people uh, either with or without ruxolidinib, and is in continued ongoing trials. Nevitoclax, here's some data showing improvement in spleen. Even in individuals that were on rux, they had a suboptimal response. We added the second drug and some improvement in spleen symptoms and fibrosis. With CPI 0610 or Pelabrecid, these are the earlier studies, again showing improvements in transfusion independent and transfusion independent, improvement in spleen, improvement in symptoms. Indeed, we're trying to move forward. And these new studies that are looking at combinations in in newly diagnosed or JAK inhibitor naive patients is, are very interesting. And we have the four JAK inhibitors and if all are approved, they all have benefit with spleen and symptoms. And none of them have been correct compared directly head to head. So it's very difficult to say that, that one is necessarily better than the other. I, I suspect that they will all end up having kind of their own niche in a variety of ways based on what I've shared with you. But combinations that might come with a higher response rate, but also might come with other additional side effects and certainly additional expense are, are, are exciting, but I think much that we will learn from these clinical trials regarding these combinations. Indeed, we're at a period of time where there have never been more trials ongoing for myelofibrosis than at any point in, in history. Uh, and all of this is, is good news. I certainly will have patients say, boy, you know, which of these should I be on uh, or should I be on a trial? Again, an important discussion with your doctor. In short, if you're on a JAK inhibitor and you're doing well, probably should wait to see how all of this evolves. Changing if you're doing stable and doing well on a current therapy is probably not advisable. Most of these trials are, are really there for individuals in which this current status quo is not working well for them. The one big exception where we've been from the past is that there are the new trials for people that are newly diagnosed, need therapy, but have not yet started on a JAK inhibitor. So in that setting, that may be a strong consideration with the, with the currently the combination palabrasive study, the Vitaclax and others likely to come. Now, which therapy is best in second line? I think it is still too early to say. And I suspect that it won't be the same answer for all patients. I think that we likely will see a variety of things that we learn from the trials that may help us to individualize which therapy is best for which individual. So what is that MF outlook? 
Likely approvals of pacrinib soon, knock on wood. And I would anticipate mamalotinib not that long after, but a, a period of time between the third and the fourth drug approvals. There are a huge number of MF studies. And again, you know, if you have MF, the studies that end up being beneficial may end up impacting you, you know, whether you're on this study or not. So some people say, you know, boy, you know, I really want to be on this drug, even though I don't qualify. You know, it's okay. Wait, be stable, have things monitored closely with your doctor. It, and, and if the drug ends up meeting its promise, it likely will become an option for you. We are learning as well that really trying to optimize the medicine that you're on is key as well in terms of dose, timing, and other things. So sometimes if we're in a race to get to another drug, we sometimes might really blow past the benefits of the drug that you're on. Finally, like I had mentioned in ET, the trials that specifically are targeting calverticulin may be an option for MF patients in the future as well. Now in the future, I think, again, I'm giving you a river of options. So how do we weave all of these together in terms of trying to come up with an individualized approach for you as it relates to features of your disease, the molecular profile, and others? I think that will be where the art of medicine meets the science. Our group has clearly been also very interested in non-pharmacologic approaches. All of this should be viewed as being in addition to everything that I've discussed, not instead of. I think yoga can be incredibly helpful, decrease inflammation, improve sleep, but I do not think that you should do yoga alone as opposed to being on a JAK inhibitor or interferon. Now, these are things to be used, I think, in combination. Yoga can be helpful. We're learning more about it, but it helps to improve insomnia, likely helps to improve sleep, and there's a variety of different programs out there that can be very gentle to be used. There are a variety of things to really help to try to overcome some of the anxiety and the uncertainty. My colleague, Jen Huberty, that leads scientific efforts for CALM. We have a variety of different trials ongoing with that. And Dr. Paternos at Mayo Clinic that's been working on a study, really helping to deal with mindfulness and resiliency as it relates to uh, dealing with your MPM. Finally, Dr. Fleischman and others have been leading the efforts trying to better understand the impact of nutrition and diet. People ask me, is there a perfect diet to be on with this? Uh, I think probably being on any diet is, is helpful, meaning you know, a structured way that you're eating that is mindful of the composition, of volumes, all likely has an impact in terms of how you're feeling. Probably overall in medicine, the diet that we view as the most healthy is what's called the Mediterranean diet, the easiest to follow. Uh, but like all diets, you know, issues of volume are also important as well. So multiple additional complementary approaches, and we continue to try to refine these to share with the medical community for people can have these as resources to use in parallel. So in the future, I think you can expect more of your MPN therapy. I think there will be further individualization. Uh, I think we will move to better really trying to monitor what is what does success look like? What are our goals? What's progression? I think we likely will have new approaches, immune-based vaccine uh, type and others, but these are, again, not quite ready for prime time. Uh, many more options, much more research but I think it is a time for us to be incredibly hopeful. And uh, for my own sense, I could say that I'm incredibly grateful to one, all of you who so generously participate in trials and these efforts to help to advance MPN research for yourself and for other patients. Wonderful groups like the MPN Research Foundation and MPN Advocacy and others that really help to create a community to help to advance things for you. Uh, and obviously, uh, I'm just one member of a broad team that cares deeply about all of you as individuals, and we hope to have exciting new options for you in the future.